So I'm going to turn it over to our guest of honor, who's going to talk about the BGO. Um, and uh, I'll let I'll unshare this and let him start his talk. Take it away, uh, Blake. Thanks, Rick. Thank you all for having me. Uh, this evening, I wanted to kind of not quite do a demo, but but sort of walk through some of the things that I do when I uh, am using the BGO. I'm still using this this equipment, uh, but just want to give a, a really good high level overview and and hopefully encourage you somebody to some of you to maybe uh, set up an account and use it. Um, it's very easy to use. It's fun. And uh, you, you can do do different things, uh, uh, casual projects, maybe some actual research and things like that. Uh, let me just get my notes um, here one second. So the, um, <clears throat> excuse me. The BGO stands for Burke Gaffney Observatory, and Burke Gaffney, he he, um, uh, Reverend Burke Gaffney was the person that was uh, is considered the founder of uh, astronomy, uh, the astronomy department at Saint Mary's University in Halifax. So this this uh, whole system has been named. Uh, the whole observatory has been named after him. Now the Magic family, they were very instrumental in uh, the setup of the observatory. They um, uh, are you guys hearing some background noise? I, 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 there's not a lot. No. I don't. No. Okay. Hopefully no. it's not too bad. If it is, I can mute for a second. Uh, if it gets really busy or noisy here. Um, so the Medrix uh, made sort of the observatory happen, and it was originally installed in 1972. And it's been used, obviously, uh, at the university in the their uh, ver various astronomy courses. They they teach observational astronomy. Uh, it's they have a active public outreach program, and there's some modest research that's happening by by students and PhDs and, and things like that. And then some of the people like us, amateurs, are maybe doing some some research uh, too. Uh, major work happened in 2013. Uh, and, and this was driven by uh, David Lane, who many of you know. He was the director for many years. He's recently uh, retired uh, by... By a weird, funny coincidence, I was actually at Neath in New York a number of years ago, bumped into him when I believe he was shopping for the telescope. Uh, so it was a funny coincidence uh, at the time. And then in 2015, he implemented this. He rolled it out. The Burt Gaffney Observatory became the first fully robotic observatory that was available for anybody to use and interact with via social media. So completely unique, very groundbreaking in, in that sort of respect and free for anybody um, to, to use. Uh, if you're very new to this, it's not unlike if you're familiar with other systems, things like eye telescope or SLU. So, so you may have seen or, or even used some of those systems. In general, those are paid services, and you you could say you get what you pay for in all of this. That with the BGO being a free service, that it, you don't have total complete control like you may expect if you were using something like um, eye telescope. Now, as I mentioned, this is at St. Mary's University specifically. You can see the observatory building or structure is atop a tall building. That's a 22 story building, the student residence building. So while it's kind of downtown Halifax, you do have pretty good elevation there uh, in, in the physically um, in the sky. 
Um, but you keep that in mind. You're dealing with a little bit of uh, light pollution there. Um, just just being in the in the city proper. The um, uh, and of course, if if you're going to use this system, you got to remember to offset your time uh, plus one hour for for at least for those of us who are in Ontario. So here's the business end of the telescope. You can see there's a bunch of cameras there. There's filter wheels and so on. But ultimately, you're you have access to a 0.6 meter or a 24 inch telescope. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. What's what's that name? Cat, the I've forgotten the CDK acronym, but it's the corrected. Um, Dahl Kirkham. Uh, thank you. Uh, type of type of telescope, and and it may not be obvious, but in fact there are two cameras there, and they have two or dedicated set of filter wheels. And sort of one set is the scientific filter wheel kind, um, like R and V and stuff like that. Uh, and then the other filter wheel is just classic sort of uh, RGB um, uh, stuff. There's also additional or specialty filters like uh, oxygen and hydrogen and so on. Uh, out, outside the dome, uh, uh, on that previous shot that we saw, there's weather instruments as well. So you've got local weather conditions that are being constantly monitored. Um, so that that's the gear that you have access to. The website has all the particulars of the uh, the actual instruments and filters and so on. Some relatively new news is that the original mount, an ailing mount, was replaced, and now there's a plane wave L600 that's driving the system. And obviously, it's more modern, it's better in in many many ways. So that there's again a good shot, and I believe I neglected to mention the current um, technical the uh, manager of it and she's in that photo that's tiffany so uh, uh tiffany fields is now the um what what we um uh, all of us that use it refer to as the human so if there's a glitch if there's something special that we need to do um if um some something needs to be uh, corrected a cue needs to be adjusted more flats need to be run and so on uh, tiffany helps with those sorts of things and she she and i were liaising uh, ahead of this presentation. So she was making sure that I had my I's dotted and T's crossed in this. So when when you want to interact with the uh, system, once you have an account set up, it's it's pretty straightforward. And there are a variety of means that you can use to, to talk to the telescope. Uh, many people use Twitter uh, to do that, uh, but other other social media uh, tools can be used. Now, I was kind of one of the early adopters in the system, and I initially requested an email account. So that's what I've used a lot. I'm, I don't generally use Twitter. I'm I'm kind of off Facebook now, so I don't I don't use these other resources very uh, very much. Um, so so uh. It, I sent a lot of job requests by email. So just the properly formed uh, header or subject line, the correct content in the body of the email, and, and I'm able to uh, submit uh, jobs or adjust them or edit them as needed. Now, after a couple of years, Dave Lane wrote a custom app. So there's a, a tool, a software app, pretty small, lightweight, that can be used on uh, Android iOS, and also the Windows platform. So I've got that app installed on a couple of places, my phone and and my uh, computer. I helped uh, Peter. We set it up the Windows one, right, on, on your computer. So uh, what I like about the app is the immediacy. If I send a request, I get a response instantaneously. So it, I'm instant messaging effectively with, with the telescope. But obviously, the emails are pretty quick, but you know it's a few seconds or a few minutes later before I know if I have a ba badly formed request. So I, I prefer now to use the app to um, immediately get my things in the queue, to find out the weather status and, and things like that. And continuing with respect to the software, if you want to do things like check status, monitor things that are going on uh, with, with the telescope. There, there's lots of ways to do that. 
Tiffany shared with me just the craziness going on with Twitter that it, she said if they start charging to send messages, she said it won't be long that that they stop using that service. Uh, so probably the the days are numbered for the Twitter interface, but again, lots of other resources are uh, available. She's also setting things up on Mastodon if you're not not familiar with that. Um, so that's another option that you might explore as well. And the the Q pages themselves, you can give it a bit of status from them. So the website interface uh, is another way that you can get some information about you know what's going on right now um, with the telescope, what's the weather like, and and things like that. So as I mentioned, you you need an account to do all of this, but it's pretty straightforward. There again, everything's very well documented on the website. So you just fill out a, a simple form. You submit it, you indicate, you know, sort of why you're interested in this, um, what your affiliation is. If you say Rask and you say, I just want to take pictures of galaxies, you get your account. Um, so so that's all good. Now, keep in mind, this is all a shared service. And at any given moment, um, there's lots of stuff going on, particular what I, what I call, for lack of a better term, the high watermark. Uh, you know, dur during the school year, you can expect that uh you you will not necessarily uh have a very high priority so students the the astronomy and astrophysics students they have first cut at this and they're they're doing their work and they have assignments that they're they're tasked with and, and they're using the equipment and then on a particular evening there might be an education public outreach event so no remote access is available. Everything's sort of turned off while they're doing their local show and people are looking through eyepieces or or in the dome. Uh, so at, at any given moment, there's sort of activities like that that are happening. But the system, again, is open to the public. It's designed this way. Anybody can use it. There's a lot of rascals that, that have accounts. You'd see a lot of names that you'd recognize if you looked at um, who the, the uh, authorized users are. And then there's people from the general public. Now, you, you you know, if you get to know and and are doing some interesting things and get to know some of the people involved and so on, it, it is possible to make special requests uh, of Tiffany. Um, I do things like uh, just sort of pay attention to usage patterns. And, and in general, on full moons, pe people aren't doing stuff. And, and that's when I do things like shoot double star images. So if you're if you're sort of sneaky about sort of your planning and and things like that, you can sometimes get near immediate results. You you submit something in the queue one day and, and you get your images the next day. There's been many a time where I've been monitoring the Twitter feed and I see a message that says the queue is empty. So I I grab a job and I send it in, um, and it and it gets queued up right away. So it sometimes it's surprisingly uh, fast. I didn't mention at the beginning of this, but my whole slide deck here, I've already converted to a PDF and I'll put it in our forums um, at the end. So all the links that you're seeing in here, you'll have all these. You don't have to write them down or do a snapshot right now. Um, I'll share all that with you. Uh, again, popular methods for communicating with the telescope and, and getting uh, requests queued up. Um, are sending a tweet, and I'm not I'm not getting into all the syntax of it here, but you can see you you use the address at SMU uh, geo uh, geobs, um, so the St. Mary's again University Observatory, and then you form a command, and there's a hashtag used, uh, and then it's followed by some parameters or elements to make it do what you want to do. So you, you just got to learn the syntax for a couple of these commands, and then you address the tweet appropriately. Facebook Messenger, similar sort of thing. You connect um, with the um, the uh, SMU Observatory account, and you form your command with the appropriate hashtag, and off you go. I'm typically using either the app and doing it inside the app, or I'm sending an email. And in the email, you just make sure you have the hashtag listen to me in the, the header 
in the subject line, and that will catch the attention of the, the robot um, as it receives that email. And in the body, at least at the beginning uh, or the top end of the body of the email, you make sure you have your cr critical commands and the tags and the elements there. Something new with email, I, I wonder if they've been getting email spam a lot, uh, is that um, you need now to include a token. But uh, I, I hadn't used the email for a little while, so I generated a token. That's mine to use forever. And I just make sure that I include that now in my subsequent email messages. So pretty straightforward. Here, here's a few example commands. It's not computer programming. Um, you, don't, you don't have to have uh, uh, coding experience, but you just need to make these well-formed um, commands. You can see they're, they're all starting with a hashtag. So a quick command that I often use to see what's going on at the uh, observatory is uh, hashtag weather. Uh, so I'll get a quick synopsis of what's going on there. When you're interested in imaging an object, you might want to first check that it's a, a identified in the catalog if it's a bit off the beaten track, like say a PGC galaxy. So you can do a lookup to make sure you get the right thing that it exists in one of one of the catalogs uh, behind the scenes if you're familiar with it um, the uh, kind of the engine of a lot of this is Dave Lane's earth centered universe so the catalogs that he uses are are what are kind of driving this it's easy with things like messiers and NGC objects um, you, you can uh, sort of blindly refer to those you can see I've got m57 in that middle example um, the, the other reason you might do a lookup is to know the the correct sort of syntax or the not syntax, but the correct nomenclature, the right way to refer to the object. So maybe the you you're going after obscure galaxy and again the PGC doesn't work, but maybe there's a, it can also be referred to by an NGC. If you submit a job and you realize later, oops, there's something I want to change, you can edit them. So that's good, and you can even delete them. The middle one is the the one I really wanted to draw your attention to, because this is this is what I'm typically doing. That I'll submit a request, I'll indicate the object, and then you start to provide some of those parameters. How long do you want to shoot? So you can indicate the exposure time. Which filter do you want to use? You can indicate that. There's filter codes. You can see it's pretty straightforward um, for for the oxygen filter to use that. And then you could do some other things like maybe indicate the minimum altitude. I might use the parameter max moon to limit um, how much moonlight I'm going to tolerate for a shot. And you can add comments as well um, to your uh, queued jobs. So there's a whole bunch of parameters here. Again, this is all well documented. There's kind of two sets of documentation. There's the basics and then there's an advanced page. Um, if you're going to do things that are uh, more complex. So so hopefully that gives a sense of how easy it is. It's pretty easy to, to get something in the queue and uh, make sure you're going to get the results that you want. When, um, when I shoot images, I'd like to get weather data. Uh, when um, things are looking like they're going to be clear at the observatory, I might casually monitor again the Twitter feed and, and I'll I'll sit, also see what the weather's looking like. If I've got a galaxy in the queue, you know, am I am I going to get good transparency that evening? What what's going to be my outcome and so on. So there's lots of weather resources. I do the usual stuff. I watch the Halifax clear sky chart closely. I I don't know <laughs> if you you've ever sort of thought about this or noticed it, but but um or at least for me, uh, it's very apparent a pattern that the clear weather that I experience here, home, over Ontario, shows up in Halifax a day later. So, so that's sort of neat. If I see really good conditions um, here, then then it's gonna uh, there's and I've got things in the queue the next day. It's very likely um, that they're gonna run that that I'll get some shots back. Um, the next day, but I'll, I'll watch things like their meters that they have there. They can, they've got sensors that track uh, wind, humidity, uh, cloud temperature, and sky temperature. 
and that's one of the graphs here i'm showing the um uh, one of the two graphs that's available that has some two two plots in it there i'll watch the i'll watch the satellite uh, uh data as well to see if there are clear patches going over um halifax and and I, I don't know if you're familiar with it if you use that tool but i use the clear sky alarm clock in conjunction with the clear sky chart so i'll all receive notifications of clear conditions for halifax so again that'll get my attention that'll perk me up um and i'll anticipate maybe some jobs running uh, when, when that happens again if i've got nothing to do one evening or there's i'm just sort of i'm pretty sure that the conditions are, are good and that there's going to be good imaging run and i've got something in the queue that i'm interested in i might just leave the twitter page open and and watch the feeds go by and see if my jobs come up uh in, in the queue or see i'll watch for that notification that the queue is empty um and, and i might uh, squeeze in a job really quickly there um so again it, it's really easy to monitor it right now at least on twitter um while that exists um i've I've uh, set up my Mastodon account um, to also monitor it there. Uh, Tiffany hasn't uh, documented all that yet, but she's working on that. And uh, you'll be able to easily monitor on Mastodon if you have an account there. So I've, I've seen my notifications showing up there too. I forgot to mention Mastodon here on this slide. And, and again, the observer request page is you, you can get a bit of status information there and you can see if your job's been, if it's queued, if it's being uh, um, run in the queue and that it's completed in the queue. You can see that the night of um, uh, when, when uh, the observatory is active. So the next day, feels like I skipped something there. Yep, sorry, sorry. Um, the next day, if you're lucky, or, or when when um, uh, it might, you know, it might be a few days before a job gets processed, but but you'll get some sort of notification um, that your job is getting completed because I have an email account. I always get an email from the BGO that tells me that um, my images were done if there weren't any technical problems with it. I had a job in the queue last night messier 85 and something happened so there was a technical error uh so that was the email that i received that my job is still in the queue um and and there was something wrong with the camera so i just got to wait again um for that but you could see i've i've got my personal queue page here i did a snapshot that from a while ago but you'd see all the various jobs that were listed there the date they were added to the queue the date the image was taken it's assigned a request id number um, and then there's some other details of, of that there. So that's sort of my personal page of the obser observations that I've done. Um, when you click on the request ID, um, the request ID number for the job, what you get is this page. And this shows you what, what's been captured um, for that particular uh, uh, job. And you actually get a snapshot. You get a JPEG image, low res, uh, and that JPEG image you can immediately use if you want. You can put that on your social media. You you can put that on your blog. You can put it in your your blog notes, uh, whatever you want to do. You can also see that there's a high resolution JPEG that you may download. So again, you may prefer to put that one out on social media, the, la the larger version, um, if you want. Um, I'm interested in the FITS images, so I'll download the FITS files um, that, that are pr produced. So if you want to do some high-end work with all of the data or the complete data set, um, and, and if there's other things that you want in, in the FITS uh, file, like the FITS header data, that that's all available to you as well. So typically, I'm right-clicking on that that fits image link and downloading the appropriate fits files to then do my subsequent work. But that's nice. You get your immediate results page. You can see what you got and you can use that, those uh, JPEG images immediately um, as, as you see fit. Uh, in my case, I have special privileges. So I often um, have collected 
the the red, the green, the blue, the luminance data for a lot of my targets uh, or whatever other filters that I've requested, and I get a single monolithic large FITS file um, or FITS files in a single monolithic zip file. So I download a, a large zip and I've got everything in that um, in my case. Now, where do you go from here? Uh, this is going to be really different for each person and what your objectives are. But in my case, I'm working with the FITS files. So, so there's pre-processing that has to happen. And I use FITS Liberator. Rick, the that um, dark energy camera that you were showing, I noticed one of the affiliation was the Noir Lab. And the Noir Lab now is in charge of the current version of FITS Liberator. FITS uh, Liberator version 4. Um, is is uh, very powerful. Uh, it's my preferred tool to use now, mostly because it supports dark mode. Um, so you can see I've got it running with a sort of dark background here, but I'm doing a stretch. Um, you can see in the histogram down at the bottom to draw out the uh, image. If you look closely in that image, you'll see all the stars are green. So they've been bloated. They're, the stretch is too much. Um, for, for them. So some gymnastics, uh, some work uh, needs to be done in the this app, the pre-processing here to get things uh, working well to then do subsequent work down the line. But primarily, I'm just doing basic stretching and uh, flipping if necessary. And then the final thing is to convert into a, a usable format for a, other software uh, and again, people's pathways will be different here, but I will typically either use uh, Photoshop uh, or GIMP to to do the final processing of the image. So here, here's a um, on the right, you can see uh, that the luminance, the red, the green, the blue filters, uh, images uh, that have been captured from, in this case, an Apogee uh, CCD camera. Uh, so I've got the four image ready for assembly. Uh, in, in some software and and everybody has their their particular methods that they use but most often I'm doing my lrgb processing in an old version of photoshop um and I've started doing ahead of that actually gradient removal uh I'm I'm no great shakes at image processing but um I'm just keep trying to learn it and get better and better at it but obviously I'm doing in uh photoshop all the regular stuff uh, levels curves uh, cropping, uh, the uh, registration merging, blah, blah, blah. A fascinating feature to me of the BGO is that if you don't have the software for post-processing, if you don't know how to do it at all, if you're bewildered by it all, you don't need to. There's a new set of commands, a relatively new set of commands under the process banner. So a hashtag process command is available. You can apply process commands to your stored images and the BGO will do it. So you can do things like um, apply a stretch. You can uh, change the saturation. You, you can... Um, do a lot of basic image processing and it's all done on the bgo system uh so that that's sort of neat i don't use this per se i'm doing it myself um but i've tried it a few times and it's it's neat how it how it works it means it's really easy for the people that don't have the software or or don't know how to handle um don't know how to do some of the the typical sort of processing let let the BGO system do it. There's a great video that Dave Lade made that walks people through the processes. And again, this is all fully documented. So it's it's really fascinating when you think about it. It's a soup to nuts solution. You can get these very nice images out of the system. Um, and it's sort of uh, all, all taken care of by the robots. So just some final sort of closing slides here. This ain't eye telescope, it ain't SLU. You do not have direct access to this system. You basically submit a job and you, you get put into the queue 
and you wait until the queue is processed and your images then uh, are available to you. So this 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 whole notion you got to have in the back of your mind um, that that you're prioritized. Uh, and when it's in the student year, probably around you know this time of year, April, May, June, students are maybe really busy working on assignments and projects, then um, something that you submit may not get processed for a week, two weeks, maybe a month. Sometimes I forget about things and I get an email in the morning that your job was processed. Oh, cool. I had forgotten about that image. But again, there's been other times where I'm I'm watching it. It's a, Maybe it's a bright moon. I see the queue goes empty and I get an image back the next day. So if you're if you sort of pay attention, you can get some pretty quick results um, from it. Of course, you're dealing with maritime weather, so uh, we get hurricane seasons. So so the system will be offline. Their winters are usually pretty brutal, um, but but uh, um, keep 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 that in mind. There's a bit of local light pollution, but I've not found it, you know, uh, crippling or or terrible um, here. So that that's pretty good. Um, you do want to be aware if you're going to use this, what the various technical limitations are. There's max limits on brightness or magnitude of an object. There, there's field of view um, considerations. That this is a pretty long focal length um, system. The the BGO proper, uh, the the Dalkirkham uh, 24 proper. So so keep keep that all uh, keep that all in mind. Uh, some samplers here, and in fact, that this image. Uh, is not mine, but it's the one that got me going about all of this. When that system was first being deployed, one of the local uh, Toronto Centre members, I was in the Toronto Centre at the time, uh, Katrina Inslum, if you are if you know her, she uh, heard about the system. She loves using social media. She was very intrigued by this, and she imaged that comet. So if you can make out the very small printing there, that's um, C2013, boy, I can't, that's pretty small print, but it's the Catalina. So when she shared that image, I went, wow, that's pretty neat. I could do that. So, so I thought, okay, I'll set up an account and, you know, I'll try a couple of things like some comments and stuff like that. But then it occurred to me that, um, I didn't, at the time, I didn't know a lot about LRGB uh, imaging and processing and stuff. And I thought, what a great way to learn it, that I can use this tool, gather all these data files and not have to worry about the hardware and all the software bits. And, and I'll have images that I'm interested in and I'll learn how to properly do post-processing imaging. So, so I started, you know, uh, trying some things. And in very short order, I thought, um, well, I, I need a project. I, I want a campaign, something to go after. A and and it just popped into my head one day. The, the RASC finest NGC list is a fantastic list of interesting deep sky objects. Why don't I use that as a project? I'll shoot all of them for, for fun and, and see what I get. And it was amazing. It, it was a great project. It took me four years um, to do it to get all but two of the images. Um, two of the images were out of limits for the telescope, couldn't go low enough. Um, so the two I had to capture by other means, but um, I was essentially able to image all of the finest NGCs. And I really, really enjoyed that. And there, there's one of the ones that I did, the um, uh, that, that um, uh, Galaxy, the Splinter or NGC 5907. And that's one of the ones I got lucky at the processing too, uh, that it it came out really well uh, on, on my first go. Um, the the gradients weren't too bad. I was able to get the color rendering the way that I wanted. The stars are bloated, but but I didn't know at the time how to make them smaller. Um, but I, I was pretty happy with with that result. It's on my uh, my smartphone that image. I have also used the BGO to monitor supernova. So there's been instances where some star has popped um, in a galaxy. So uh, every day I would send in a job request. Uh, uh, and the intent was maybe to make a, a movie to show the brightening and the dimming um, of, of that. So that particular one uh, is in the um, 
the Supernova 2017 EAW in the Fireworks Galaxy or NGC 6946. And I think I captured, gosh, maybe two or three dozen images uh, of that supernova slowly fading out um, over the months. So that was neat. And I, I do um, a double star work work with this um, in sort of two aspects. One, I just shoot them because they're interesting colors or interesting double stars. But there's instances, no, knowing the resolution of the system, uh, there, there's instances where I've tried to measure some double stars. Uh, as long as they're not within five arc seconds, I should be able to resolve them. Uh, so I, I enjoy doing some double star work, uh, some of it more scientific oriented um, with the uh, system. And it's possible to image planets too, even though there's magnitude limits um, uh, or brightness limits with the sensors. Uh, in, in some cases, people are imaging the planets. That particular one, this image, I did not shoot. Again, uh, Mariah Quintus uh, shot Uranus here, but she got she got a bunch of the moons. And I I fired up um, Sky Tools and uh, on that date and time to figure out the moons. And she got a Ariel at five o'clock, Oberon at seven o'clock, uh, Umbriel is about the eight o'clock position, and Titania is in there at the ten o'clock position. So he, she got a bunch of the moons around Uranus. So that that was pretty neat. So why would you want to use this? I for me uh, again, I I was immediately intrigued at the idea of being able to learn how to do LRGB processing or other types of uh, uh, multi-filter processing without having to worry about the gear. It, it's not my pig. I don't want to have to worry about um, the equipment. You know, I, I, I do with my own stuff. I'm fine with that. But but I just wanted a system that I could immediately use and I'm cheap. I wanted something that I could play with and experiment with at least at the early stages. Um, you know, I'm I'm really tantalized by the the whole imaging thing, but I I don't want to pour a lot of money into it if I'm really not gonna enjoy it uh, or be good at it. So it's a this is a great gateway for people that want to get sort of started with that. It's also very instructive learning how to do what you can to what degree you can do things using a remote system you know understanding its parameters and and its requirements and how you can wrangle it um e even though this is a very public open system i feel like i've got pretty good uh handling on it and and i can kind of make it do what i want it to do uh there might be projects that you're working on um fun or uh, serious projects it's really good at helping you plan well given weather conditions and your targets and your seasonal sort of activities when things come in and out of season and stuff like that so i found it very very helpful in that respect i'm much better at these all of these things now it's fun something to do on a cloudy night um again you can do some research there i didn't mention at all but there's a whole time series sort of capability of this as well i've never used this sort of feature of it um, but things like variable star measurement and and uh, things like that are done by a number of different uh, observers. And there's lots of discovery uh, uh, potential here. Um, there's been a couple of times where I've had to blink some of my images because I wonder if I had found something, uh, like maybe a supernova. I haven't um, in, in this case, but but I still, you know, I try to take the time to blink some of my images. There, there's a possibility that there's something there um, that, that uh, hasn't been found anywhere. So that's always a, a, a possibility. With, with this sort of system. So again, lots of sort of neat benefits. Maybe some of these might might be of interest to you and so on. Uh, where did it all start? It it's Again, it kind of started with Dave Lane with his backyard observatory, the Abbey Ridge Observatory either, or the ARO. And, and that was his sort of test environment where he developed a lot of the software and the, the interface with social media. He deployed it at the university. But at the same time, he's made his personal observatory available. So to RASC members, you can also apply for an account to the ARO, which is in his backyard. It's a C14. Um, he's got an SPIC camera on that. So I've used that rig sometimes for some of my other projects. One of those two targets, that I couldn't get 
from the rooftop of the student residence, just the way the dome is structured, the BGO and so on, I could not get the sculptor galaxy too low. But NGC 253 is accessible from the aero. So, so I just switched to that rig to get that second last image for my finest NGC project. Uh, and uh, Dave Lane was literally there on site while I was shooting that because we were just trying to get it when it and it, when uh, the galaxy went through a notch in the trees um, out, out on his property. So he was literally sort of standing there going, okay, it's, it's going into the trees. It's going into the notch. <laughs> and, and we saw the images come up by the robot and it was uh, great. It's a much darker space as well. So if you're, if you're interested in some fainter uh, targets, that might be a, a, the, the better sort of platform to use. Once again, it's all documented um, that, that particular uh, thing, but the overall commands and interface and how you use it the same once you learn how to use one of these. In addition, uh, there's a third telescope, uh, which a lot of us call the Mini Ralph, but uh, it's the Mini Robotic Observatory or the MRO, and this is good for wide field. So it's a, you can see there's a classic old Teleview um, 100 millimeter telescope there. There's a ZWO camera on the back end. Uh, again, filters available, various filters available. You can see it's right beside Dave's uh, 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 C14 inside the dome. And it that's in a, a little thing we like to call the doghouse, that that little structure folds up around the telescope to protect it. But in clear weather conditions, that that thing sort of opens up like a clamshell. And now you've got um, a nice wide field scope. And the image I captured that you can see is of the triplet. Uh, the the Leo Trippet with the Hamburger Galaxy is there. So that's been fun when I've wanted some big things like together, like the whale and the hockey stick all in one shot. Again, I'll share this presentation with you. So you'll have all these links here, but uh, the astrophysics department link is noted there. This is sort of who owns the, the BGO. There's a main BGO page. That's, that's really that second link is your... Uh, going to be your home base if you want to use this uh, system. Uh, there's a Facebook group uh, that uh, people um, communicate on. So again, occasionally I've sort of jumped in there to see what, what people are talking about. Um, uh, more and more people might be using Mastodon. So I've got the link there for that. And as I mentioned before, Noir Lab now are, are the people in charge of Fitz Liberator 4 to do your pre-processing of those Fitz images. And that's that's all I have for y'all. I hope that that has given you a good sense of what the BGO system is, how it works, uh, how you could get going with it, sort of what I do as I um, use it. I'm having to take, if I've not gone too long here, I'm having to take any questions if there are any. And again, I'll share this whole slide deck on the forum uh, 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 later tonight. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Blake. Um, I made an account. I had, well, it's 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 died, but I had an observer number, and uh, got the uh, email back from saying, "Here's your observer number. Uh, go with God and sin no more." But <laughs> if I go into Communicator, it wants a password. And mm -hmm. I, where do you create a password? So um, I I don't think uh, we can get in the technical parts of it here, but but uh, yeah, I, the, I um I have it's so long ago now I forget the particulars of it, but but I had a, a password I have a password that's associated with my BGO, my MRO, and my ARO accounts. Um, okay, but, so uh, okay, but I, I sent them an email, mm -hmm. authorized, blah, 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 and I got the email back. Okay, you're accepted. Here's your observer ID. But nowhere did it ask me to put a password in. I just did it, and it said uh, they still have to authorize my account. I got that email right away just now. 
and it says your account will be reviewed by an operator before images can be taken. Okay, no, so I've so, got, so, I've, so Rick, maybe you got a follow up and it Rick, went to spam or something. Yeah, yeah. Rick, I, I think the simple thing to do is that you just need to reach out to Tiffany and and I don't have her general email in front of me, um, but um there there's a general purpose email that you would use. And I think you just need to say to Tiffany, um, I wanna I wanna use the um the app and I need to set up the password for that. I don't okay. I don't remember what I did again because it was so long ago, but I I um that's all you gotta do. Okay, because I got the reply from them. BGO says your observer account, blah, 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 has been reviewed and updated. It expires on, well, it's expired now, but I can do it again. You are a member of the observer, observer group. Yeah. I'll have, somehow I'll have to, when I renew it, I'll have to figure out somehow to put a password in. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have the app on this particular computer that i'm sharing from right at the moment um, no I can, I can figure it out but i just uh you know I, but I, 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 i've just launched the app on my phone it automatically goes to my mro account which mine has my mro account has expired but i just jump to setup i choose observer one that's my bgo account and it's got my observer id number and my password associated with that and, okay, and then i then i switch back to text mode and now i'm logged in to my bgo account on the okay, so you create the password in the in the in the app i'm telling you rick i can't remember because okay, it was enough. so it was so long ago so okay. you you just need to reach out to tiffany and uh, i'll be able to get you that that general uh, address um, for Tiffany, I uh, or we can that we can maybe check right now. So here's the um, a queue page that shows uh, everybody everything in the queue right now. There's 162 um, queued observations. Some of mine are down here um, in, in the lit. There's one of mine right there um, uh, in the hopper. Uh, and again, you might recognize some people. There's Dave Chapman. He's a regular user of the system but let's let's do something here let's just see if we can find that um address uh, general address for you so if we go to um uh here we'll just open up some of the general sort of pages um so here here's the getting started and i think there's going to be uh just an email link here somewhere if you have some trouble yeah, yeah. that's that that's all good yeah uh, yeah and so got... just just read this and and uh pursue that um there there's the get help uh hashtag human command and so on. so you just need to follow up with um uh with getting the account set up um it just needs to be completed for you it's incomplete at this stage get renewed um get it set up and um and ultimately it will be tiffany helping helping you with that okay all right thank you I I didn't catch it. Who who just created their new account? Andrew, Me. good. Andrew, good. yeah, yeah. So yeah, good luck with that. I hope yeah, you have fun. Exciting. Hope you have fun with that. And all of you, I'm I can entertain questions. Uh, uh, you know, afterwards, if you know, a couple of weeks down the road, you're trying some things in BGO. Hey, how do I do this on BGO? I I might be able to answer it uh, for you. So. Don't hesitate in the future to also reach out maybe via the forums about some projects or sure, maybe the, the syntax of a command or things like that. Yeah, the forums would be good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It might get more people involved. Yeah. Did you um, ever make a movie of the supernova? Uh, I I didn't um, do that. Uh, I don't think I did, but I, I do have some little movies that that I did of other things. I'll do I'll show you a quick example here just from mm -hmm. my blog. Um I was sharing this just the other day uh with someone. So I follow two rapidly moving stars, um Bernard Star and Wolf 359. Do you see it? 
there, right there. That's Wolf 359 moving a very high proper motion. Um, so that's a little movie of, well, I think, four or five frames that I've got. So that's, that's individual images that I've collected year by year, roughly at the same time, um, to, to show that uh, proper motion real, proper motion over a, very, a, a yearly phase. Very cool. Um, I, I, I need to normalize all those images to make it not so flashy. Um, but I just did that really quick and fast in GIMP um, with the individual images. Um, so that's one of them. And then Bernard, I think I've got a movie of Bernard's now. So let's see if I have that as well. So there's a still of Bernard's. Did I do a movie of it? Uh, I thought I did, but maybe not. I was certain that I did. Oh, there's Bernard's Galaxy with the BGO. See how faint that is? Crazy. Crazy faint, but I was pleased to get it. Uh, so I thought I did a movie of Bernard's, but maybe not. But obviously that bright star and it's move that's moving at a pretty good click. Um, geez, I thought for sure that I did it. There it is. So there there's a tiny two frame. Um movie of bernard star moving so that's two year uh motion over one year so again those, great... those things are oh. easy to easy to do yeah yeah and it's a good little project mm -hmm. blake have you got any idea how deep the images go on a routine basis what's the dimmest star in that picture um it does go deep right it's a 24 inch scope um do I know the number off the top of my head? I, I'm pretty sure I've been able to get into magnitude 1920 ranges. Let's do a check here. Uh, I'll go to my life list because I keep um, quasars. So I've, I visually observe quasars, and then there's a bunch that I've found um, in some of the BGO images. So let's just have a quick look here. Some of these ones lower down. So there's a magnitude 18.2 V. Um, what else? Uh, well, there's some, uh, there's got to be some fainter ones here. 18.6. Yeah. So, 18 right, right. Nine. So, so there's, some pretty faint quasars that I've imaged with that, but I'm pretty sure I've seen mag 19 and 20 stars. I There's believe. a 19 too. Okay. Um, so, so ob uh, obviously you, you can go pretty deep. Maximum exposure time is 60 seconds uh, uh, on any particular camera, on any particular filter. So six, 60 seconds with that 24 inch aperture, you're, you're going pretty deep. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't have that exact number off the top of my head. Um, uh, I could show it in sky tools, but again, I don't have that on this computer. And, and the, if I can toot my own horn a little bit, I'll just show you the specific gallery which is still in work i have i made a dedicated finest ngc gallery so there there i'm starting or here i'm collating all of the the finest ngc images that were captured with bgo and um, maybe 20 percent of those so far i've done the color processing work um in them so you can see that half of them are or a good chunk of them are still um in um in black and white there, there's the, um, the sculptor that I couldn't capture with BGO proper, so that one was captured. The sculpture, sculptor galaxy that was captured with Dave's ARO rig. Uh, there's a a bunch of the color ones, but I you can see I'm still working on the a bunch of these. Lots of great objects though, but that's the whole finest NGC. Uh, project that that's all 110 
And you can see I've took some of the images of, of for some of the big things, some of the big objects. Um, I've made multiple images, kind of um, a, a mosaic-like effect. I've, I'm actually reacquiring some of the large objects. So you can see there's just a fragment of the rosette. So I'm doing a, a, a multi-panel mosaic of the mosaic, uh, uh, of the, uh, the rosette. Um, I've already captured the east and the west veil in more detail um, for, uh, for these. And I was just looking quickly. I don't know where it is in the sequence here. I was just looking for the one final image that I, I couldn't get with none of the telescopes out, <laughs> out east. So one of the targets I just shot in my backyard. Uh, so it's one of these color images somewhere here, but uh, nevertheless, that's the that's sort of the collection of the my finest NGC project that I uh, uh, did with the BGO, and that was a lot of fun. And I'm still learning from that. I'm this is helping me get better and better and better at um, uh, post image processing. Blake uh, Harold taught, uh, has a has a question. Harold, are you still there? Can you unmute yourself and ask your question? I just don't know what the hell I'm doing on this thing. <laughs> well, we can hear you fine, Harold. Go ahead and ask if you're if you're up for it. I have no actual question. Uh, you had asked um, asked me to uh, go on and, as a participant or something, and I can't see anything that directs me there. Yeah, that that's okay, Harold. I I just did that as a matter of a formality, and if you're satisfied, if you can see the uh, if you can see the presentation on your screen, and if you can hear Blake and 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 uh, hear our hear our conversation, then you're you're doing fine. Is that all right? Yeah, I'm fine with that. Everything's going great. Your... Okay, great. And just raise your hand again if you have something else. Okay. Will do. Okay. Good to hear you, Harold. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. nice to see you here, Harold. Yeah, thanks for jumping in. Yeah, Blake, I know you helped me out last year when you first mentioned this whole thing to us. And uh, I, I did submit a request for an observation of Uranus. And I, in fact, I what I did was I submitted two requests. And one I knew was crazy because Uranus is a fairly bright target. And I asked it to do the, I forget, you said the maximum was 60 seconds? So yep. I, I, think, I think that's what I did. I asked it to do a 60 second image of uh, Uranus and it told me, no, nope, not gonna do that. <laughs> but, and that's fine, because I wanted to know how, what, what its response would be. But uh, I never did get the the other request uh, for my image of Uranus. And I, I kind of wondered what happened and I haven't checked it lately yet. Knowing that you were gonna talk about this today, I should have gone in and seen if there was a message for me. Because uh, I think I had, uh, a, had the notifications turned off so that in order to read the message, I actually had to go to their website if i remember correctly oh well, let's see if it's in the queue here i don't see anything in the queue yeah i'm i'm reluctant to try and access it myself because i'm still hosting the webinar here and i don't want to interrupt that but so there's there's lots in the queue here um now there's another way that i can do this um I think you so will look for me in the observers list. Yeah. yeah. Why don't we look for you this way? I can't remember my observer ID, but yeah, yeah there so I am. Here, here you are. Yeah, that's me. Yeah. And you have one job in the queue, and there it is. And you've set it to looks like 10 seconds, minimum altitude 25. You can drop that if necessary. Uh you have no restrictions on max moon, so that doesn't matter. So it, I was it looked we'd be able to get Uranus even if there's a full moon. Yeah. So it this to me looks like a well formed job, and it was you could see it was submitted in January twenty seven. Yeah, that was just after you you talked about the project the first time. Yeah, yeah. So it it looks good to me. Um, what you might do is um, just. Uh, double check what the altitude of Uranus is, it is sort of now, right? And if it's close to that 25, maybe what you want to do is reduce or lower 
the minimum altitude to give it more breathing room. Classic thing, right? Imagers want to image high. So, it, you know, I'll look at that. I'll calculate uh, or or plot uh, using some other tools, typically sky tools, uh, will tell me what the maximum elevation is when it's culminating, right, at, at the meridian. So let's say I determine that my target's going to reach up to 65. So what I'll do is I'll set the minimum altitude for my job to be 60 or 55. So I'm what I'm doing is I'm forcing the object as high as possible. Uh, but I still want some breathing room there uh, to, to um, uh, give it some latitude to get it into the queue or get it to be processed from the queue at a particular time. So I very carefully check that with a lot of my targets. What's the maximum altitude? When's that going to happen? Um, set my minimum altitude uh, a little bit below that um, to get it as high as possible, but still to have some wiggle room. So there's one of those tricks where I figured out how I can wrangle it a little bit to get sort of decent quality, um, but get it to still run, not be overly restrictive. But also I'm paying attention to the season um, as well. I try to do the classic thing that lots of imagers do too, and that is image well after midnight because your sky is always a bit darker there. So, so I'll look at what's happening seasonally for targets and I'll try to get them into the queue when they'll be culminating after midnight, not, not before midnight. For double stars and stuff like that, I don't care about that. But, but if I'm going after a faint fuzzy, uh, then I want it to be in a darker, darker sky if I can. So there's little tricks like that that I do. Um, now, it, it, if we've still got some more time, we could cue something here. So if you want, we can um, to run a job. Again, I don't have the, I didn't think to sort of to install it on this computer. So sorry about that. But but I can put a job in the queue on my phone. So you want to do that? Any requests? <laughs> well, I'd like to image uh, series. That's what I was looking. Oops, sorry. I'd like to image series. I don't know if you want to try that. The star? The no, the dwarf planet one minor oh, planet. Excuse, excuse me, yeah. I I see what you mean. Um, yeah. So we could we could do that. Um, so so I, what I'm gonna do is just for you, just to sort of show you what I'm kind of doing um, here is uh, I'll just write out how I would form the request. If, if I was writing it in an email, right? So um, it's going to be hashtag request. And then we need the um, uh, the uh, object um, here. And I'm going to cheat just because I forget all these things. But I'll, I'll just use some of my old notes here just for quick reference here. So I'm just pulling up my Evernote. Um, here to do that. Get out of the way here. Just juggling windows. So I'll just look up a previous queue here. So here we go. Here's here's the oop, here's the syntax that we got to use carefully. So request object equals, and then we should just be able to do that, right? Um, and and that's the bare minimum that we would need for a request. Now, do do we want to do this in a particular filter? We just just a, a white light, yeah, just plain old filter. So we'll we'll say um uh, uh filter equals loom. Now loom uh triggers that it's the filter wheel in one of those two filter wheels um on the back of the camera. If I said loom two it's going to switch to the other camera. So, so you, you want to know your filter names and, and you can't mix and match. You got to know what set is in one of those wheels and, and use the appropriate labels for those. So I'll keep it on the, I'll keep it on the Apogee camera uh, as opposed to the SBIG um, camera. Um, so Loom now will do that. 
uh now do we know some particulars of it how when's it what, what's it sort of how's it moving through the sky right now when when's how high will it get do we know anybody know that i can um, look yeah i don't know it's up it's pretty high it's, uh, it's in leo and the right ascension is 1158 and declination plus 1426 uh rick what about um uh maximum elevation altitude ra deck the system knows that i don't need to know that what's the ra what's the uh, alt and ad is going to be particularly the maximum alt i'm looking it up in sky tools here so bear with me i can look it up pretty quickly here it's right right near that end star in leo it's, yeah uh, denabola okay so I'll just do it this way. I've got, I'm actually in a, a listing that I use in Sky Tools just for general purposes. So I'll add series um, here. Just give me a second. So I'll add this into the list. So there's series. And what I do is I um, uh, look at the apparent data. So true altitude 57. Um, is what it will hit in this evening. Do I have Sky Tools set to tonight? Is that right now? Yeah. So it's that's the maximum possible altitude that we'll get for series. Okay. So that's a good little piece of information. So what we can do then is set our um, uh, min alt to something less than that. Uh, so the default we saw in the system, Peter, for your job was 25. You didn't change it. But I think you can force uh, the BGO down to 20. Does it go down to 15? I can't remember. So you can push a bit lower, um, but 25 is the default. But in our case, we could say 45. Um, so so we know at some point it's going to be, um, it's going to go above that. Um, so th those are typical things. And, and let's get a comment in here um, as well. So we'll do comment equals and uh and then we could put a note um for rask london now because i put spaces in there you, you gotta do a trick here you gotta put the your quote around the the whole comment there to get it to behave but uh, that looks pretty good to me um that's the um what what we can try to submit now and, and what i'll do you know what? Just just might as well do the whole experience here in email. So I'll just I'll just do this in an email now to the to the observatory. So let me open up my personal private email for all of you to see. And I'll just go to my um sent uh folder and I'll just pull up an old one. So I'll look for the word listen. So here's a bunch that I've you can see I've done over over time. I'm I'm watching IKPEG if it blows up one day. <laughs> There's my rosette stuff um, where I'm doing my mosaic. So I'll I'll just pick one of these. Um, I should have a recent one here because it's got my token in it. I'm doing this on email, so I'll I'll just make a a brand new uh, email. So we'll do uh, edit as new. Here we go. So you can see I've got the recipient bgo robot at uh so that's all good the important thing is listen to me is in the subject line um, to get its attention but now we can do what we want series for london uh and i've got a little snippet here i'm just playing around like i'm talking to it um it, it ain't ai <laughs> so but i break my request up just so it's easy to to form it all um, so we'll just take take my stuff from our little note here. So we'll take series, uh, pop that in there. We'll just do a single filter um, here. And we said loom. And we had our melt minimum altitude. We did that, right? And for the comment, we'll, I'll just pop it in here again. Rask London um, series near Denabola. So how's that look? There's my uh 
Here's my job request here. Looks okay. So yeah. simple request, request object filter that you want, some other parameters. Um, that's that pretty token? Cool. So with, I think what was happening is that the BGO was starting to get spammed by email. So I think that um, they added a token thing just as a way of further authenticating that it's a real human putting in a real request. So without the token, it will reject it. So a, a new thing is you have, it's a one-time only thing that if you're going to use email, you have to apply for a token number. It's automatically assigned. It took seconds to do it. And then you just include the token in there. If I'm using the uh, mobile app, I, I don't need to do that. It, the, the, it's all authenticated internally, obviously with the password. Um, so, so this is just to make sure that emails out of the blue are, you know, coming from a real, a real person, a real user. Uh, okay, so let's send it. There we go, done. So we'll wait a few seconds here. And and if that's badly formed in some way, we'll see. So there's my outbound. And we'll just hang out and, and watch, watch for that email to come back in. We could go to a queue uh, and see it um, popping up um, here. So let's back up in our queues here. Uh, and let's look for me. And there's my job so far. So you can see that. Uh, uh, oh, there's my two accounts. Actually, I, uh, this view is showing me that that I have an uh, SMS text account, which I didn't use. Um, that primarily I've done things by emails. And you can see there's all my observations, 643 to date. Uh, that I think that still got me in kind of the top 10 users uh, as the most frequent user of the BGO system. But I, uh, now that my finance NGC project is done, it's sort of quiet now. I'm, I'm not doing as much uh, work there and others have surpassed me. But I was number one for a long time for the most number of jobs. And there's three now. So there it is. It was accepted. You see it? There's our uh, queued, queued result there. Um, so there's the ID number that was assigned. Object name obviously popped up. Uh, the system identified it. There's my note um, that I put in there. Um, I didn't set the exposure time, actually. We totally forgot to do that. Um, so that might be way too much, um, actually. Let's think about that. There's the filter that we requested. And there's that minimum alt that we specified. So everything's pretty good there. But that, um, Andrew, what do you think? Is that exposure way too long? It might be. It's pretty bright. I don't know what it's magnitude yeah. six or something right now. Yeah. So this gives us an opportunity maybe to do an edit. So why don't we wind that down a bit? Um, so, uh, so what we'll do is we'll... Do Observer's another observer's handbook on page 241 says that the uh, magnitude of series is uh eight point uh sorry 7.9 or eight yeah so around eight mm, okay yeah and if i pop into sky tools right now it'll tell us what it actively is right now so 7.93 oh, okay i thought it was bright. okay so so let, let's drop that um let's drop that down now, I haven't done this for a little while, but let's give it a whirl here. So I'll just I'll just use this as a starting point um, here. I'm kind of winging it on this, but we'll do a request. And uh, uh, I mm, oh, I'm quite rusty about this. It's it's in my slide though. So let let me pull up the slide deck here. Because I've got that command listed there. So here's what it, it's going to need to look like. I'm going to need the ID number. And then we'll specify the parameter. So in the email, it's going to be not a request this time. It's going to be an edit. But I'm going to need the, the job number. So we'll go look that up. And we'll set the exposure. That's the big thing we got to do here. We, we left it at the default. I, I think I might need the token. So let's leave that in there. So ID will go to the queue. 
and there there's the number I was assigned. So let's copy that just so I don't goof it, fat finger it. There we go. So what what do you think for our exposure, Andrew? Ten no seconds. idea. Yeah. Say again. Five seconds, 10 seconds. Yeah. Okay. Try 10. All righty. So let's send that. This is just trying to edit the queue there, edit our job to make sure that we've got a good, good sort of number there. That should be instantaneous. So we'll just reload that page. So it's still sitting at 180. I'll reload it again. Let's check my email to see if I got a bad, badly formed response. That's the outbound. There's the reply that I got from email that the job was accepted. That was the initial one. So that's the one where it went into the queue. Check the email. Here's a new reply. It's been edited. And I'll, there it is. So there's Perfect. our 10, 10 second revision. So there we go. Pretty easy, eh? That's so cool. Pretty, and I'm doing that by the email interface. Again, I would typically do this, uh, uh, you know, on my, uh, in the app. And it's even faster, right? I get the, that immediate response. I can tell right away that I I compose the command properly, proper syntax, stuff like that, uh, as opposed to the sort of back and forth jumping around. Um, so uh, again, I, I like using the, the mobile app because I know I'm doing it all right and, and getting the immediate result that I want, but super easy to check, monitor the queue and, and make sure you've got your parameters set up the way that you want and so on. Now I, I reached out to, to Tiffany um, over the last couple of days and uh, I didn't hear from her today. She's super, super busy, but I, I told her I was going to do this, that I would uh, uh, get us to pick something put it into the queue and I asked her if she'd keep an eye out for it and if she'd do me a favor. So I asked her if she'd elevate it. So I'm I'm hoping she'll see that communication and maybe um, we'll get this to run because I checked the weather in Halifax. This is my Halifax portal page that I use to monitor various, you know, our all of our favorite tools like Clear Sky Chart and, and uh, things like this. So this is my personal portal page for for Halifax and I saw that the conditions were looking good lots of blue um, not necessarily great conditions for for um, uh, imaging all kinds of objects but here was the Halifax clear sky chart that I grabbed midday and uh, again looked like no clouds going on seeing not great but so be it but I thought hey we're we're going to have clear skies. So again, uh, that's when I reached out to to Tiffany and say, uh, uh, we're doing our meeting. I'm going to ask the the team what they want to image. We'll get it in the queue and uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. But you can see when I showed you the whole queue before, <laughs> there's there's lots of people there, right? Um, so if we look, if we look at the complete queue, um, there there's lots of, um, uh, observations, um, lo lots of stuff going on. So here's the request, and now we're up to 166. Okay. So, and and even though I have some special privileges, I'm still in the observer class uh, here. So that's got its whatever particular priority rating. You can see if you scan through this you'll see observer priorities and group priorities and stuff like that that were all part of the this, this whole mechanism that dave lane built students you know get the first cut so so here you can see there's connor smith there's this he's taken the astro 1000 course so that you can see some of the students in there and then you've got um research observers so that that's uh, presumably a, a a student or maybe a prof um do, doing something there's there's power observers here, uh, so they, these are um, recognized users doing a lot of uh, different work. A lot of variable star people um, are uh, have have that status. Uh, you'll see the telescope operator is in here. John Reed um, is uh, listed here, uh, and uh, again, a lot of people just from the public playing around. 
learning. Like you can see lots of different targets are here. Lot there's a lot of variable stars in here. Is this list that we're looking at presented in the order of most recent request at the top? Or does yeah. this show that you are actually number one in the queue now? Uh this is the date requested order. Okay. But it doesn't it, tell you what order you are in the queue. Uh no. Okay. So there's a uh a uh what's the word? There's an algorithm that is being used um when when the uh observatory system detects that there's clear conditions and that the observatory is going to open then that algorithm gets applied to the queue uh and uh driven uh from the priorities the uh again students up at the top um are getting queued up first but stuff gets start stuff gets pulled out of the queue now you can actually see not sure where i think you got to go into the system logs you you can actually see what the the queue is generated for that session so when you know the observatory is running on a particular evening somewhere in here uh, i'm not sure exactly where it is you can actually see okay what what's the sequence for this evening who uh who whose jobs are being processed right now what's the sequence of them and it, it, you can imagine that algorithm is doing other smart things don't do a big slew from one side of the sky to the other so it's doing smart things like trying to work in a certain part of the sky to be efficient um get get things in a certain region before doing big moves um and so on so there there's a lot of parameters there i i couldn't tell you uh, it'd be interesting to sort of pick dave lane's brain about what he's done to make that as efficient and as effective um as possible so obviously a lot of parameters are being used for that. But but there is a way to, to see in one of these, you know, what's going to happen this evening, um, what's going to happen for this run. So it, it that's clearly not that one. <laughs> but there's a, a lot of um logs that you or cues and listings that you can pull up to to determine that. Again, I just watch the typically the Twitter feed just to see. Okay, what's going on? Um, well, what's happening? Uh, if I pop into my Mastodon um, right now, uh, we can just look at that sort of quickly. So here, here's my notifications. So 23 minutes ago, BGO said the sky is clear and I'm getting ready. So, so that's great stuff. I, I'll, uh, that's what I've typically done in Twitter to go. Um, to see if my job will come up or I'll watch for the queue being empty and I'd, I'd fire something in if it's uh if there was something I was working on and, uh, uh, and interested in trying to get a quick result on. Does that make sense? Makes sense to me. So Blake, yeah, this is all um, public. Uh, and so everyone that puts in their request, it's, you know, obviously it can be anyone that's approved. Um, the results, the data that is sent, is that personal? That's only sent to you? That isn't posted, you know? So say you see someone on the queue who's requested something that you want to see, can you, you don't get to see their data and see whether or not their parameters were appropriate or not appropriate. All the data is public. Oh, okay. So you can see the results of their requests. Yep. Okay. I've just gone into the completed queue and here's stuff that's been done and you can see what they did. Okay. So this first one here by Matthew, Sunflower Galaxy. Oh, that's cool. what That's what he did. So all of the work, everything that's done, every image that's captured here uh, unless there's some override applied to it, and I think in general that's not done, that that everything's visible. Okay, that makes sense. And that's probably what should happen. I just, I didn't realize that yeah. was what happened. Yeah. So that's great. So it, it it it's interesting on one hand, you know, somebody had said to me, why would you shoot the finest NGCs? Because other people will have done that. 
And my first response actually was actually no. I looked in the queue and pe people didn't shoot them all. Yes, people shot the Hamburger Galaxy. That's one of them. But but everybody's doing their own thing. But it is also interesting from another point of view that you can go see how they did it, what what settings they used. Um, conditions vary, of course. So you'll get a bunch of people that send in some good jobs with good parameters and the sky conditions are poor. Um, maybe the transparency is really off. So, so some people will get a good image. Other ones won't be as good. Um, there, um, there could be various factors that affect that. So it's sort of interesting looking back at some other people's work, you know, uh, well, how did they fare? And then there's optical train issues that, um, uh, there might be images that have flaws due to a tracking error or uh, um, fl flaws or, or, or they're just badly rendered. Um, a problem may be in the, the pre-stacking uh, processes that are done by the observatory uh, or there's significant uh, vignetting and dust donut issues and they they need to shoot another round of flats um to to deal with that so so occasionally i've looked at other people's work but it, it's interesting i just i just kind of do my own thing i know there's image people have captured some of the targets that i already have but it, i i just i just sort of do my own thing but the reverse also applies it means that your observations of those targets are available to other folks mm -hmm. and that actually is more useful for something like um outreach or even mentoring mm -hmm. you could take a, if a high school student asked us about projects we could mm -hmm. say something like oh we have a member who photographed all of the finest ngc objects with the brook avenue observatory and that high school student could then learn how to access your targets without having to go through the four-year process. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. I think that's a really powerful advantage of having it be public. Mm -hmm. And as you were speaking there, it it occurred to me that there's a discovery opportunity as well. Maybe somebody does find a supernova in some galaxy, and then we can data mine all the images, if we're lucky, maybe somebody captured one six months ago, two months ago, a year ago, so we can go back through those and and see if we can get some pre-event uh, um, imaging or, or or early in the event um, as it was beginning to occur before anybody noticed it. So there's there's discover opportunities too, and obviously there'd be the appropriate tagging. Here's who got it first. Um, so that that's sort of neat. There, there's lots of lots of uh, spin-off benefits to how how this works. Yeah. Talk about a modern plate library. <laughs> <laughs> so I just I popped over the Mastodon just to see if if activity has started up yet. It's at 29 minutes now. So it doesn't like it looks like it's shooting yet. Um, I'm just looking through the old queue, what it did. Yeah, so you can see some some of the other messages here um, doing calibration, shutting down the observatory, processing. And that's typically in the morning. It's doing its processing stuff, waiting for sunrise. Um, so... So lots of good messaging either on Twitter or Mastodon that you can see sort of what the observed. There's one. The queue is empty. <laughs> uh, so there's been many times where I've went, oh, look at that. <laughs> and grabbed some job, some little project that I was working on and sque squeezed it in and, and got it the next day. So that's been fun, you know, finding those sort of pockets um, in the queue where the the jobs that were in the queue didn't work well. Maybe they were, they're, 
they had some elevation restrictions. Maybe it's not the best evening. They're they're falling out of season, uh, something like that. So so you get these pockets from time to time, and and I've definitely taken advantage of that. It's been fun. How many do you think they might go through in a in a night? Like just, I mean, obviously mm-hmm. there's going to be a lot that aren't that aren't appropriate and they can't do. But if you see that big queue, how many do you think might be done in a in a night? Yeah, there's a f- few factors, right? I I seem I think I've seen some cases where there were sixty different things that got processed. It could be more more or less, right? The big thing is how long is each person's request so when i've done uh you know tip a typical galaxy um thing uh the this is just my double star list there's there's fast moving doubles there's the the fat there's the proper motion star wolf 359 but i'm let me just pull up another list from my evernote um you know more typically a galaxy so that request again i have a special privilege here where i can request multiple filters at once so that's luminance 60 seconds 10 subs red 60 seconds five subs uh and the same for green and blue so if you do the math of that that's about a 30 minute run so if people submit a bunch of those, that's pretty up near the maximum limit. Um, the maximum of single job could be about 30 minutes. Uh, so if you have a bunch of those and, you know, we're getting near uh, 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 um, the solstice, right? Short evenings. So you've only got about four hours of imaging time and... And if I submitted eight jobs, I'd chew up the whole queue. <laughs> so, so lots of parameters there uh, that that would affect all of it. But, but it's typically dozens. I and I think I've seen up to 50, 60 get processed in a particular evening. We could sort of suss that out if we look at uh, the completed, and just just looked at the dates there. So there's four jobs that were done on the 18th right if we look at the 17th four so just a handful well that's um, that's, re- that's requested isn't it and then the, the next no these next are the completed yeah, i'm so in the lots. look at them all i'm in the completed but we're seeing about four per night for the last couple of nights and then down to one here why who knows but half the time it's weather, right? So er, the observatory opens, everything's fine, and then the cloud center cloud sensor triggers. Um, so, uh, and the 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 system can't plate solve, so so a bunch of jobs get rejected. Um, it's not it's not that their parameters are wrong or anything like that, but the system can't can't plate solve it. Um, so it just gets left in the queue. So, so uh, just just scanning there. So here's a busier night. So we're getting up to about ten there. So really varies, right? Lots of factors. We can imagine all the all the things that might happen. But I I think there's been some cases where I've seen a lot, a couple of dozen, um, three or four dozen in some cases. Around Christmas time, I'm always putting things in the queue, and of course, it, you know it's holidays, <laughs> so so I I just hope for clear weather, and and there's been a few times where it felt it felt like I've had the run of the telescope, you know. There's just a few people playing with it uh, in during holidays and stuff like that, and long dark winter nights. Uh, I've I've been able to get a bunch of things done 